Um, my name is Eve Zimmerman. I'm director of the Newhouse Center for the Humanities. We are thrilled to have Professor Samuel R. Delaney here as the first guest in our Distinguished Writer Series for 2019. Before I introduce Professor Delaney, I'd like to mention a fact I learned only today. Clarissa Scott Delaney, the aunt of Samuel Delaney, graduated from Wellesley in 1923. A legendary figure and poet in the early days of the Harlem Renaissance, Clarissa Scott was Phi Beta Kappa at Wellesley and the first African-American student to win her varsity letter at hockey here. We found the 1923 legend today, uh, but we're gonna dig deeper into the archives to learn more. A proper introduction to Samuel R. Delaney and his work is a daunting prospect, which I won't attempt today. <laughs> Trying to sum up Professor Delaney's writing is like grappling with the quantum theory of many worlds. You think you've accounted for a good number of them, but soon he has dreamed up yet one more. The metaphor of world for a work is a useful though tired one. Nevertheless, Delaney's works are worlds unto themselves. Reading his masterpiece on the AIDS crisis, the tale of plagues and carnivals, plunged this reader back into the streets of the West Village in 1984, where the young men on Christopher Street began to grow haggard and die. Delaney's work requires concentration, for it is an oeuvre in which language takes flight, amazing us with its versatility and athleticism. I'm going to give you one memorable quote on a more cheerful note from Plagues and Carnivals, in which the Countess congratulates the master on a myth about his origins, a false tale. The master muses, quote, what an interesting and complimentary way of stating what I'd done. Was it factual? That didn't occur to me, nor I doubt to her. <laughs> Rather, the word seemed like though some traveling tale teller sometimes tosses out an extraordinary phase for the most ordinary occurrence, which from then on makes both occurrence and phrase hold in memory." Unquote. Well, what better way to describe the brilliance and the craft of this particular writer? Before we begin, I would like to thank a few people. First, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to John Plotz, professor of English at Brandeis University, faculty director of our Cornell seminar this spring, and current Newhouse Fellow in residence. John will serve as moderator of our discussion after Professor Delaney's remarks. Second, as new director of this center, I'm committed to involving Wellesley students in the intellectual life here. Today, Tavi Gonzalez, assistant professor of English, invited Samuel Delaney to his class, Writing AIDS, 1981 to the present, and I'm truly grateful to him. I'd like to invite you to stay for a reception after the lecture. And without further ado from me, Samuel R. Delaney, pioneer, American writer, and literary critic, speaking on the topic of Afrofuturism. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Eve, very, very much. And thank you, everybody, for coming out of this. The title of this talk, uh, and uh, this is kind of a kind of a work in progress. Uh, um, I, this is the first time I've ever given this particular talk. People have been asking me to talk about Afrofuturism for quite a while, and I'm never quite exactly sure what I was supposed to say about it. Uh, so, but the mirror of Afrofuturism. Unless we set up our critical mirrors very carefully. Arguably, there is no such thing as Afrofuturism. The term was co coined by a white quit critic, Mark Deary, in his 1993 essay, Black to the Future, included in his collection Flame Wars, the title of which is a riff on the 1985 Robert Zemeckis film starring Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox. 
The initial writers Jerry discussed included white cyberpunk writer William Gibson and at least two other black and at least two others, black West Coast writers Octavia Butler, who had been publishing since 1971 and whose first novel appeared in 1976, and he interviewed me a black East Coast writer whose first novel, The Jewels of Aptor, had appeared in 1962 with at least one important black character and arguably several others. But it was far enough in the future for it to be unclear whether uh, the way races are usually conceived of still held true. For his article, Deary, 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 Deary also interviewed black journalist Greg Tate and black culture critic Tricia Rose. Uh, he managed to sneak Gibson in because Gibson's first book had talked about some black Jamaicans in his future world in his then popular debut novel, Neuromancer of 1984. Apparently, what's needed for Afro Afrofuturism is black characters in the future. <laughs> Or in my own Fall of the Towers trilogy, the story was set far enough in the future in that fragment of the world for recognizable races based on melanin to have vanished, whatever the race of the writer. From my very first novel, and in pretty much every novel I've written since, there were black characters, but rarely were there exclusively black characters. Though I'd grown up in Harlem, from the beginning, I went to white private schools and had both black friends on the street where I lived and white friends in Horace Mann Lincoln and, Dalton, and the Dalton School and eventually the Bronx High School of Science. As an adolescent, I wrote a few stories about black families. There were, there were a trio of them called Tales of the Binomial Expansion which included what I was rather proud of, called Black Women and Their Children. It was part of what I was then calling a novel, Those Spared by Fire, which sadly was eventually lost, along with a whole carton of other novels and stories at the time when carbon copies were the only way of making duplicates in an epic even before Xeroxing. I repeat, to the extent Afrofuturism concerns science fiction and not the range of all the arts, including painting and music, classical and jazz, it requires writers writing about black characters in the future. That, I think, is interesting, and that's what I'm going to discuss here. Two novels by white writers, more Than Human by Theodore Sturgeon and The Stars My Destination, Aka, Tiger, Tiger by Alfred Bester, uh, both have black characters and black women characters at that. In short, Afrofuturism, at least as Deary describes, as it, describes it, is not contingent on the race of the writer, but on the race of the characters portrayed. Now, certainly sometimes some people write about it better than others, but uh, we're going to take that as the given. <laughs> More Than Human consists of three long stories that center around a group of characters with very special gifts. Despite the gifts, two of them are males whom most people would see as backwards. That is, you know, in the past years, the brief-lived series <laughs> Sense8 two seasons, 2015 and 2018, felt much like an imitation of more than human. I don't know whether many, some of you may remember Sense8. Uh, I was rather fond of it, and I thought it was pretty good. The first tells of a young man, okay, but now we are back to more than human. The, <laughs> the first tells of a, the first of the three sections that make up the novel tells of a young man named Lone who is the focus of the first story, which is called The Fabulous Idiot. And the second entails a group of children, among them a baby, who is just called Baby. At first, he appears to be developmentally challenged, though actually he thinks like a supercomputer. But someone has to read his mind in order to access Baby's knowledge. Two of the women in the group 
are a pair of black twins, Beanie and Bonnie, who can teleport themselves and what they can carry and are part of the group that includes a relatively normal appearing boy named Gerald, who is an orphan, and a girl named Janie, who is an all-purpose mind reader and also can perform telekinesis. Together, they form a new kind of human entity called Homo Gestalt and have a deep mental connection for which they themselves use the word bleshing, which is a combination of blending and meshing. Tiger Tiger tells an exciting adventure story set in a future where all normal human beings can teleport or, to use the common phrase of that era, can jaunt. There is space travel all through the solar system, but jaunting is confined to the surface of the various planets and outer satellites. The main character, Gully Foil, or Gulliver Foil, undergoes a set of adventures that more or less retell the story of Edmund Dantes in The Count of Monte Cristo. There are three women whose importance shifts throughout the tale, each associated with a different color. Gisbella McQueen, who is an underworld thief and fascinating character, who is a fellow prisoner with Gully and the Gouffre Martel and helps him break free. Her color could easily be red. She has red hair, and, and, and he was a Robin Wensbury, one of the other characters, is a black woman teacher who is a one way telepath who can only project her thoughts rather than read someone else's. She is in charge of Gully, who has received a severe head wound which interferes with his ability to jaunt and which she helps him overcome. Olivia Prestain is the albino daughter of a far future billionaire. Prestain of Prestain, who is blind to ordinary light, but sees the world through infrared illumination alone and becomes an important figure in Gully's life as he tries to climb the social ladder to get revenge on the people who first did him wrong when he was wrecked on a spaceship floating somewhere near the asteroid bed belt although she sees in the infrared range, basically because she is an albino, she is very strongly associated with the color white. She is a white woman squared. <laughs> yeah. Neither of the two books appear, say, to, to pass what, for better or worse, is sometimes called the Bechtel test, <laughs> an idea I put together myself in the 1960s and committed print to print in the Women in Science Fiction Symposium, written in 1974 and published in 75, and which Alison Bechtel took over and <laughs> talked about in her own dykes to watch out for. <laughs> Yet, between the energy of the writing and the structure of the story per se, Bester and Sturgeon, working in 1953 and 56, respectively, managed to produce science fiction novels that have been cited as among the best written in their decade. The relationship between Tiger Tiger and The Count of Monte Cristo is somewhat hard to pin down. The Count of Monte Cristo is over 900 pages long, Tiger Tiger crams the same basic development into a 250-page novel basically divided up into two parts. Of the three stories comprising of the three stories comprising more than human, one part tells how the, all the characters get together, part two tells how they stay together, and part three tells how they survive in the world by acquiring a new member uh, and through him develop a sense of morality. Uh, they, are only uh, uh, they are only minimally longer. If we look again at our title, Afro Afrofuturism, there doesn't seem to be much about black character characters as such in the plots I have summarized for you. Indeed, there is the problem that slays a gr that, that is the problem that slays a great deal of science fiction criticism. The truth is, the black twins, Bonnie and Beanie, are probably the weakest character, characters in the novel. They can barely speak to anyone but each other, and they function basically as well-loved servants to the others in the group. 
There is one incident in the second story, Baby is Three, however, where there is a slight wrinkle in this pattern. When whippoorwills call and evening is nigh, I hurry to my blue heaven. Just to turn to the right, a little white light will lead you to my blue heaven. You'll see a smiling face, a fireplace, a cozy room, a little nest that's nestled where the roses bloom. Just Molly and me, and baby makes three. Let me stop at that line. <laughs> and baby makes three, which is, the te which is very close to the title of the second story. And baby is, th baby is three. We're happy in my blue heaven. The tune was written by Walter Donaldson. The lyrics were written by George A. Whiting in 1924. And Theodore Sturgeon wrote the story of that title, uh, with, of that very similar title, approximately in May 1952, which appeared in Galaxy that October. The following autumn, the novel was published with two more sections, one set earlier, the other set later. In the novel, Miss Q, the woman they are living with, is actually dead at the end of Baby is Three. In the Galaxy version, she is still alive. You can read this one in Volume 3 of the Collected Stories uh, of Theodore Sturgeon. You can read the novel in the Library of America, American Science Fiction, 1953-1956, of the vintage books paperback, More Than Human. The title of the original story, of course, comes from those lyrics, but it comes a little sideways. It's worth pointing out, however, that it was impossible to read the title, Baby is Three, without imagining the line from the song, Baby is Three, just Molly and me and Baby makes three, which means that Baby completes the nuclear family described in the title. The actual line that gives the story title Baby is Three works entirely differently, however. Baby is now three years old, and, it, and, uh, <clears throat> and in this extended family where nobody is related to anyone else by blood except, except Bonnie and Be Beanie, who are related to each other, it is Baby's arrival at his third year without maturing at all thanks to Miss Q's not being a, a real member of the Gestalt, that tears the extended family Gestalt apart. How could I imagine that he was mine, she, Miss Q demands of herself in, un, in an unguarded moment, and uses that for justification for sending baby away to a home, and thus in the novel, but not in the original story, seals her own doom. This is why she gets killed, basically. In the uh, in the novel version of the story, you know how can uh, baby is what it one is a retarded appears to be a retarded child, and what at the time it was written would be called uh, would have been called a mongoloid idiot, and that's the phrase that is used in the uh, uh, in the novel. By the end of part one, Lone has told them they must always stay together. However. And so together, upon his death, they take off looking for Miss Q, who Lone has told them will take care of them. She is a rich spinster woman who lives with her black maid, Miriam. Watch out. <laughs> the children come in and deal with two events, both of which violate Lone's mortal order to the group. Miss Q wants Bonnie and Beanie to eat separately with Miriam, but not with the rest of the children. And again, there is near chaos about this, which ends up with all of the children eating with Miriam and Bonnie and Beanie. Why don't the twins eat with us? Miriam's taking care of them, dear, Miss Q says. Janie looks at her with those eyes. I know that. Let them eat here, and I'll take care of them. Miss Q's mouth got all tight again, and she said, They're little colored girls, Jane. Now eat your lunch. But that don't ex didn't explain anything to Janie or me either. This is Gerald who was talking. I said, I want him to eat with us. Lone said we should stay together. But you are together, she says. We all live in the same house. We all eat the same food. Now let us not discuss the matter. I looked at Janie, and she looked at me and said, so why can't we all do this living and eating right here? 
Miss Q put down her fork and looked hard. I have explained to it to you, and I have said there will be no further discussion. Well, I thought that was real nowhere, so I just rocked my head back. Bonnie, Bonnie, that's probably uh, a um, typographical error, which probably should be Bonnie Beanie. And Bing, they were there. So all hell broke loose. Miss Q ordered them out and they wouldn't go, and Miriam came steaming in with their clothes, and she couldn't catch them, and Miss Q got to honking at them and finally at me. She said this was too much. Well, maybe she had a hard, maybe she had had a hard week, but so had we. So Miss Q ordered us to leave. I went and got baby and started out, and along came Janie and the twins. Miss Q waited till we were all out at the door, and the next thing you know, she ran out after us. She passed us and got in front of me and made me stop, so we all stopped. Is this how you follow Lone's wishes? I told her yes. She said she understood Lone wanted us to stay with her, and I said, yeah, but he wanted us to stay together more. She said, come back in and we'd have a talk. Janie asked Baby, and Baby said, okay, so we went back. We had a compromise. We didn't eat in the dining room no more. There was a side porch, a sort of veranda thing with glass windows, with a door in the dining room and a door to the kitchen, and we all ate out there after that. that Miss Q ate by herself. But something funny happened because of that whole cockeyed hassle. Gerald is telling this story to a psychiatrist, by the way. What was that? Stern, the psychiatrist, asked me. I laughed. Miriam. She looked and sounded like always, but she started slipping us cookies between meals. You know, it took me years to figure out what all that was about. The other situation they have to neg negotiate is when Miss Q wants to send baby, who strikes her as retarded. I know uh, that is the term that's used in the in the novel. That's not the term we would use today. Uh, uh, to, to a home. The children cannot allow this, and the result is using their own special gifts somewhere between horror and the blackest of comedy. The loss of baby, however, is not just the loss of the limb of a limb, but the loss of a brain, and the resultant shenanigans are even more violent. Entailing the science fictional elements in which uh, in which Sci, uh, uh, sci phenomena are taken to be real and able to produce real effects. Look, I said, we don't like this any more than you do. If Lone hadn't told us to, we would never have come. We were doing all right where we were. Don't say wouldn't never, said Miss Q. She looked at us all one by one. Then she took that silly little hunk of handkerchief and pushed it against her mouth. See, I said to Janie, all the time getting sick. Ho, ho, said Bonnie. Miss Q gave her a long look. Gerald, she said in a choked short sort of voice, I understand you said these children were your sisters. Well, she looked at me as if I was real stupid. We don't have little colored girls for sisters, Gerald. Janie said, we do. Miss Q walked up and back real fast. We have a great deal to do, she said, talking to herself. Miriam came in with a big oval pan and towels and stuff on her arm. She put it down on the bench thing, and Miss Q stuck the back of her hand in the water, When then picked up Baby and dunked him right in. Baby started to kick. I stepped forward and said, Wait a minute, hold on now. What do you think you're doing? Janie said, Shut up, Jerry. He says it's all right. All right? She'll drown him. No, she won't. Just shut up. Working up a froth with the soap, Miss Q smeared it on Baby and turned him over a couple of times and scrubbed his head li and liked to smother him in a big white towel. Miriam stood gawking while Miss Q lashed up a dishcloth around him so it came out pants. When she was done, you wouldn't have known it was the same baby. And by the time Miss Q finished with the job, she seemed to have a better hold on herself. She was breathing hard, and her mouth was even tighter. She held out the baby to Miriam. Take this poor thing, she said, and put him. But Miriam backed away. I'm sorry, Miss Q, but I am leaving here. I don't care. Miss Q got her honk out. 
You can't leave me in a predicament like this. These children need help. Can't you see that for yourself? Miriam looked at me and Janie, oh, and looked me and Janie over. She was tre trembling. You ain't safe, Miss Alicia. They ain't just dirty. They're crazy. They're victims of neglect and probably no worse than you or I would be if we'd been if we'd been neglected. And don't say ain't Gerald. What? Uh, don't say, oh dear, we have so much to do, Gerald. If you and your, these children are going to live, excuse me, are going to live here, you shall have to make a great many changes. You cannot live under this roof and behave as you have so far. Do you understand that? Oh, sure. Lone said we was to do whatever you say and keep you happy. Will you do whatever I say? That's just what I said, isn't it? Gerald, you shall have to learn not to speak to me in that tone. Now, young man, if I told you to do what Miriam says, too, would you do it? I said to Janie, what about that? I'll ask Baby. Janie looked at Baby, and Baby wobbled his head and drooled some. She said, it's okay. <laughs> Miss Q said, Gerald, I ask you a question. Keep your pants on, I said. I got to find out, don't I? Yes, if that's what you want, we'll listen to Miriam, too. Miss Q turned to Miriam. You hear that, Miriam? Miriam looked at Miss Q and at us and shook her head. Then she held out her hands a bit to Bonnie and Beanie. They went right to her. Each one took her hold of her hand. They looked at, up at her and grinned. They were probably planning some sort of hellishness, but I guess they looked sort of cute. Miriam's mouth twitched, and I thought for a second she was going to look human. She said... All right, Miss Alicia. Things go fairly easily until Miss Q sends Baby to a home for other retarded children, at which point the children who have never had to separate lose it. You better get him back here, I said. You don't know what you're fooling with. I told you we wasn't ever to break up. She was getting mad, but she held on to herself. I'll try to explain it to you, dear, she said. You and Jane and even the twins are all normal, healthy children, and you'll grow up to be fine men and women, but poor baby's different. He's not going to grow very much more, and he'll never walk and, and play like other children. That doesn't matter, Janie said. You had no call to send him away. And I said, yeah, you better bring him back, but quick. Then she started to jump salty. Among the many things I have taught you is, I'm sure, not to dictate to your elders. Now then, you run along and get dressed for breakfast, and we'll say no more about this. I told her, nice as I could, Miss Q, you are going to wish you brought him back right now, or you're going to bring him back, or but you're going to bring him back soon, or else. So then she got up out of her bed and ran us out of the room. She got the treatment from the second she slammed the door on us. She had a big china pot under her bed, and it rose up in the air and smashed through her dresser mirror. Then one of the drawers in the dresser slid open, and a glove came out and smacked her face. She went to jump back on the bed, <clears throat> and a whole section of plaster fell off the ceiling onto the bed. The water turned on in her little bathroom, <clears throat> And the plug went in, and just about the time it began to overflow, all her clothes fell off their hooks. She went to run out of the room, but the door was stuck, and when she yanked on the handle, it opened real quick, and she spread out on the floor. The door slammed shut again, and more plaster came down on her. Then we went back in and stood looking at her. She was crying, and I hadn't known till then that she could. You're going to get baby back here? I asked her. She just lay there and cried. After a while, she looked up at us. It was real pathetic. We helped her up and, and got her to a chair. She just looked at us for a while and at the mirror and at the busted ceiling, and then she whispered, What happened? What happened? You took baby away, I said. That's what. <laughs> So she jumped up and said, real low, real scared, but real strong, something struck the house, uh, an airplane. Perhaps there was an earthquake. We'll talk about baby after breakfast. I said, give her more, Janie. A big gob of water hit her on the face and chest and made her nightgown stick to her, which was the kind of thing that upset her most. 
Her braids stood straight up in the air more and more till they dragged her standing straight up. She opened her mouth to yell and the powder puff off the dresser rammed into it. She clawed it out. What are you doing? What are you doing? She said, crying again. Janie just looked at her and put her hands behind her real smug. We haven't done anything, she said. And I said, not yet, we're having. You going to get baby back? <clears throat> and she screamed at us, stop it, stop it, stop talking about that mongoloid idiot. It's no good to anyone, not even itself. How could I ever make believe it's mine? I said, get rats, Janie. There was a scuttling sound along the baseboard. Miss Q covered her face with her hands and sank down on the chair. Not rats, she said. There are no rats here. Then something squawked and she went all to pieces. Did you ever see someone really go to pieces? Yes, Stern said. I was about as mad as I could get, I said. But that was almost too much for me. Still, she shouldn't have sent baby away. It took a couple of hours for her to get straightened out enough so she could use the phone, but we had baby back before lunchtime. <laughs> I laughed. The resolution of the racial question comes on page 90 of the vintage edition of the book. But something funny happened because of the whole cockeyed hassle. What was that? Stern asked me. I laughed. Miriam, she looked and sounded like always, but she started slipping us cookies between meals. You know, it took me years to figure out what all that was about. I mean it. From what I've learned about people, there seem to be two armies fighting about race. One fighting to keep them apart, and one fighting to get them together. But I don't see why both sides are so worried about it. Why don't they just forget it? They can't. You see, Jerry... It's necessary for people to believe they are superior in some fashion. You and Lone and the kids, you were a pretty tight unit. Didn't you feel you were a little better than the rest of the world? Better? Now how could we be better? Different then. Well, I suppose so, but we didn't think about it. Different, yes. Better, no. You're a unique case, Stern said. Now go and tell me about the other trouble you had about Pip Baby, and we are back to the original center of the story. Finally, in More Than Human, the fundamental question becomes, why did Gerard have to kill Miss Q? And it and the answer are as much of a shock to the reader as they would be to anyone who has not read the book. I will leave that discussion to those of you who want to take a look at the novel and see what you feel about Nat and Sturgeon's notion of psychoanalysis and the general excellence of his story. One other point remains to make about Gerald, who, as soon as the therapist Stern turns him loose to free associate, to free associate comes up with, I ate from the plate of the state, and I hate. He is a black-haired child raised all his life in a state orphanage, who at seven or eight first runs away and is discovered by Lone, who, him, who himself was a feral youngster, with odd psychic abilities, who, until he was taken in by, child, by, chi, by a childless farm family, Mr. and Mrs. Prod seems seem to have grown up outside the language of language as we know it. Either one or both, Lone and Gerald, could be mixed race, which might even account for their abandonment by their real parents. And in our culture, mixed race is another name for quote Negro black. Certainly, I, identif I identified with them both when I first read the novel. As a fairly young, I don't think, I, I think I was about um, 11, uh, 12 or, uh, or 13 when I first read it. Certainly, I identified with them both when I first read the book as a seventh grader in the tiny middle school library hanging off the library ladder uh, on the sixth or seventh floor where Mrs. Fisher was librarian. It never occurred to me to ask Sturgeon whether he had pictured black readers of his novel, though by the time I read it, certainly my family had made it clear over and over again 
that we were black, not white, and that I was a black child, Negro, I would have said at the time that I read the book and did not wonder, uh, wonder about Bonnie and Beanie, but did indeed wonder about Lone and Gerald. Uh, the term, uh, some of you may not know, but the term black did not become the preferred term until 1968, and I was born in the 40s. So I grew up as a Negro child and only became uh, black when a bunch of people plant an insurrection in my living room. Uh, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> uh, they were choosing uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's preferred term. Uh, and it was a while. Uh, there is a novel in which that insurrection, of mine, in which that insurrection is written about, uh, called uh, uh, Dark Reflections. That is actually discussed. One writer and his book who does not get into Derry's consideration at all, but certainly does in mine, is Thomas Dish's extraordinary novel, Camp Concentration. I think it's interesting and meaningful that the question is posed by a white critic and not a black one. Again, I ask you to bear in mind that historically, Afrofuturism is a white concept that does not hinge on the race of the writer. If it did, William Gibson, a white writer from Alabama, would never have been among Derry's original Afrofuturists. My own feeling has always been that as a black writer, Whatever I chose to write about in science fiction for fictional form is Afrofuturism. At least one reason Dish's novel stayed with me <clears throat> is that the first novel, it was the first novel of any sort I read where a black character in a situation that I could identify with, one in which there were both white and black characters, which had been my own situation, struck me as believable in its science fictional terms. Mordecai Washington is a black military prisoner among a lot of military prisoners at Camp Archimedes. This is, I'm giving you the background of the story of Camp Concentration, uh, which is a pretty radical novel, and it still retains its rad some of its radical thrust. Um, it was selected by the Library of America for a a collection that's supposed to come out and they it's the one that they decided they couldn't use. And I think that's interesting, I, which is a way of saying um, beg, borrow, or steal it. Uh, it's well worth reading. Um, um, Again, uh, let me, I just read, I'll read this. Mordecai Washington is a black military prisoner among a lot of military prisoners at Camp Archimedes who have been chosen for a set of mortal experiments having to do with the introduction of a spirochete that produces an effect much like syphilis, but also increases the intelligence of the human subject at the same time weakening the body until it dies. Dish does an uncannily good job in presenting the situation of his human guinea pigs and rather horrifying and the rather horrifying experiments that have been made they have been made subject to. The uh, narrator Louis Sacchetti's first encounter contains the following: when they talk about the time when both of them were in the same high school and Sacchetti was completely oblivious to Mordecai, who was simply a slow black student in his cast in his class. And uh, as I said, but uh, but Mordecai has been given this spirochete as I said, which produces this effect that also increases his, his, his intelligence. And his intelligence has indeed been very great. He says, it bugs you, doesn't it, that I'm smarter than you are? Didn't it bug you, Mordecai, when the tables were turned and when you first knew me? Besides, smiling, trying to put on a good face on the matter, I'm not sure you are. Oh, I am, believe me. <laughs> or test me if you'd like. Any time, just name your weapon, baby. Pick a science, any science. Maybe a formal debate would suit you better. Do you know the dates of the reigns of the kings of England, France, Spain, Sweden, Prussia? A scramble up the slopes of Finnegan's Wakes, perhaps? Haikus. <laughs> Stop, I believe you, but God damn it, there's still one field that I'd win in yet, Superman. Mordecai tossed his head back defiantly. What's that? Orthoopy. Okay, I'll bite. What's orthoopy? the study of correct pronunciation. 
Lucifer fallen from falling from heaven was not so dismayed. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's so. But damn it, I don't have the time to look up and see how every dinky word is pronounced. But when I say a thing the wrong way, will you correct me? I suppose a poet should be good for that, if nothing else. Well, I can identify with the character because he is a writer, and there is a good deal of humor in the way the novel's main character, Louis Sacchetti, uh, <clears throat> and the 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 uh, uh, the resonance with. Um, the term the the, uh, the two political prisoners Sacco and Vanzetti is not I think is, is inten intentional uh, uses the technology that makes automatic copies of everything he writes on his typewriter, which are given to General Hast and the chief psychologist Amy Busk, a high-ranking whack. There is also an artist named Adrian Leverkuhn, whose name Dish borrows from the hero of Thomas Mann's Doctor Faustus. Writing down what each of them is saying about the other becomes a way of maneuvering them. Dr. Busk finally runs off with Mordecai until his surprise return, which allows Mordecai to affect the novel's denouement. It was a happy accident, Hass mine, finding himself suddenly in Mordecai's exhausted frame, should panic so hectically as to produce an embolism. Mordecai maintains that it was the thought of being a Negro that undid him. Certainly Mordecai has a great deal more agency than the twins. At the same time, we have to, inf inf we have to weigh his increasing intelligence, which is pretty phenomenal, with his isolation as a black man among the rest of the poor white prisoners, who are also becoming smarter and smarter, even as they die off. Mordecai also has a believable black backstory about having been a student Sacchetti never noticed when he himself went to a high school and simply didn't see there was a strange black kid who had indeed noticed him, and he is even responsible for Sacchetti's having, having been brought, brought to Camp Archimedes in the first place. I'll leave this behind and I'll let you go hunt down camp concentration for yourself. Three years before Octavia Butler's death in, 19, in 2006 from a brain bleed, which was either the result or the cause of a fall outside of her relatively new home in Seattle, where she moved after the death of her mother, Octavia Estelle Butler wrote two stories, Amnesty and the Book of Martha. Though most of her money came from her novels, Butler's short stories are, in my opinion, her strongest work. I had the honor of being her teacher uh, for a while, uh, and so I am, uh, uh, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, there are people who like the novels quite a bit, but I like the short stories the most, and I will talk about um, one of them. Um, uh, Amnesty is one of the most interesting and inventive stories I know of in the science fiction corpus, and editor David Hartwell agreed with me, a, a white editor, by the way. Uh, it was inspired by the, the story was inspired by the appalling political situation that occurred in the late 90s, 90s involving Dr. Wen Ho Lee, who was accused with no proof of being a spy and detained in solitary confinement for nine months in shackles and released in September, 20, uh, two, September two, uh, 2000. Amnesty is an important story for at least two reasons. It is one of, sci of the few science fiction stories that gives a complex picture of what true alien behavior might be like if a more powerful alien civilization took over the Earth. It is basically a situation in which, as Butler writes in the story, quote, we've been displaced again from the center of the universe. We human beings, I, meant, I mean, down through history and myth and even in science, science, we've kept putting ourselves in the center and then being evicted. Now, that is not an original idea with Butler, but it, I think it's a true one. 
Uh, it's a, a, an eviction that occurs um, with the, everything from the discovery that the sun is the center of the universe, the uh, center of the solar system, uh, to the discovery of the unconscious as a big control of what controls our behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are in each of these, each of these great um, discoveries, kind of knocks us further and further out of the center center of things. The main character, not a woman called Moses, but a woman called Noah, was captured as a child by the aliens, who had almost no understanding of human beings and as little understanding of human beings as human beings had of the super intelligent alien communities that had started arriving on Earth. The difficulties of communication were the equivalent of human beings trying to learn how to communicate, say, with chipmunks. There is a symbiotic relation possible between the two species, but both the humans and the communities have to seek it out and accept it. The humans can be treasured pets for the aliens, but there is a secondary language that both of them are capable of speaking that the other can understand involving signals with the limbs. So what will we be then, James Ido demanded? Whores or house pets? Noah simultane smiled humorously. We are neither, of course, but you'll probably feel you're both unless you learn the language. We are one interesting and unexpected thing, though. She paused. We are an addictive drug. She watched the group and recognized that Rose Johnson had already known this and Sorel Trent had known. The other four were offended and certain, uncertain and shocked. The effect proves that humanity and the communities belong together, Sorel Trent said. We are fated to be together. They have so much to teach us. Everyone ignored her. Uh, Noah is black, as a black woman, uh, and so are some of the people she was talking to. You told us they understood, uh, everyone ignored her. You told us they understood that we were intelligent, Michelle Ota said. Of course they understand, Noah said, but what's important to them is not what they think of our intellect, it's what we can be to them. That's what they pay us for. We're not prostitutes, uh, Pidad Ruiz said. We're not. There's no sex in any of this. There can't be, and there are no drugs either. You said so yourself. Noah turned to look at her. Pidad didn't listen particularly well, and she lived in terror of prostitution drug addiction, disease, anything that might harm her or steal her ability to have the family she hoped for. Her two older sisters were already selling themselves on the streets. She hoped to rescue them and herself by getting work with the communities. No sex, Noah agreed, and we are the drugs. The communities feel better when they enfold us. We feel better too. I guess that's only fair. The ones, among, the ones among them who are having trouble adjusting to this world are calmed and much improved if they can enfold one of us now and then. The communities are like look like large bushes, and they move through. I don't know. Are, how many of you are familiar with the story Amnesty? A few people. I see a few hands. It's a very good story. Go get it. It's one of the last two stories in the revised edition of Blood Child and other stories. Read it. It may be one of the most important science fiction stories ever written. Uh, not just because it's an example of Afrofuturism. What inspired it, I think, is interesting that it was basically a piece of inhu inhuman uh, treatment uh, of an Asian doctor. Um, the ones who are among them, the ones among them who are having trouble adjusting to this world, are calmed and much improved if they can enfold one of us now and then. She thought for a moment. I've heard that for human beings, petting a cat lowers our blood pressure. For them, enfolding one of us eases what translates as a kind of biological homesickness. We ought to sell them some cats, Thera said. <laughs> neutered, ca neutered cats, so they have to keep buying them. Cats and dogs don't like them, Noah said. As a matter of fact, cats and dogs won't like you after you've lived in the bubble for a while. 
They seem to smell something on you that we can't detect. They panic if you go near them. They bite and scratch if you try to handle them. The effect lasts for a month or two. I generally avoid house pets and even farm animals for a couple of months when I go out. Is being enveloped anything like being crawled over by insects? P. Dad asked. I can't stand having things crawl on me. It isn't like any experience you've ever had, Noah said. I can only tell you that it doesn't hurt and it isn't slimy or disgusting in any way. The only problem likely to be triggered by it is claustrophobia. If any of you had been found to be claustrophobia, phobic, you would have been culled by now. For the non-claustrophobic, well, we're lucky they need us. It means jobs for a lot of people who wouldn't other ha otherwise have them. We're the drug of choice, then, Rune said, and he smiled. Noah smiled back. We are. And they have no history of drug taking, no resistance to it, and apparently no moral problems with it. All of a sudden, they're hooked <laughs> on us. James Adio said, is this some kind of payback for you, translator? You hooked them on us because of what they did to you? Noah shook her head. No payback. Just what I said earlier. Jobs. We want to get we, we, we get to live, and so do they. I don't need payback. Clearly, this is a new kind of relation that is being established between the two species, the humans and the communities. Working together, the humans and the communities draw up contracts between them, as both sides understand, but it is dangerous for the humans if the contracts are broken. There is a history of experimentation on humans, and in the course of that experimentation, many humans have already been hurt. The situation is somewhat analogous to humans discovering that lab rats were actually highly moral and far more intelligent than we had assumed they were, to the point of having a complex language among themselves. The story ends with an interesting historical denouement. I will tell you the denouement, uh, because I don't think that's what one reads the story for, uh, and we are all adults here. <laughs> we discover from Noah what happened at one point, uh, when at one point, the human ab uh, beings attempted to bomb the bubbles in which the alien communities live. We have already been told that the coming of the communities, which look like large bushes of traveling moss and can extend branches and both signal and do fine manipulation of objects, managed to completely upset the economy of the planet in a way that we simply have to accept. The hail of nuclear missiles that, they, that the humans sent to the bubbles to try and blow them up did not detonate against the bubbles, rather through some force that also had to do with what allowed the communities to come from planets beyond our solar system, whether at sub or super light speeds, we are not sure. The communities simply returned one half of the bombs which ended up in places like the Oval Office of the White House, lying on the floor. <laughs> I think that's very funny. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and the Kremlin, and any other nation with nuclear capabilities. Presumably, the communities kept the other half to use, against, against, to use again if there were another attack from the, uh, from the humans. And other, the, the, the attack the, it was just, no, here, would you like these back? <laughs> you know, and by the way, we're keeping half of them. <laughs> so, we could destroy ourselves if we wanted to, but we could not destroy them while apparently they were ready to destroy us if we did anything stupid. The complexities of the community's human relation, the community's slash human relationship is an analog of the government foreign re relationship in the Wo Ho Lee confinement when the with the communities taking the part of an unbelievably ignorant government and Noah having to defend that government to the humans simply because of the power discrepancy and the very real ignorance of the government itself 
and its ability to harm individuals whom, for some reason, it does not trust. Um, I would a ask you, when you read the story, uh, to go look up on just Wikipedia uh, the Woho, um, the Woho Lee story. Uh, there's a fairly good article about it, uh, and it's the article that uh, Butler read when she before she wrote it. Uh, uh, Butler's last story, The Book of Martha, is, in Butler's words, a utopian story about which Butler writes that she does not like utopia stories because one person's utopia is another person's hell. Thus she takes a refuge in a rather old fantasy trope that it turned out to be all a dream that she'd forgotten anyway. But it is a dream in which God in various familiar masks manifests. As such, I don't think it's as interesting as the far more politically intricate and intense Amnesty. Two things come to mind when I think about Afrofuturism. The first is something I used to tell critics fairly regularly. And I think I've told you this before, um, so I'm repeating myself. Since I am an African American, and Afrofuturism is another word for African American futurism, or at least it has been up till now, whatever I do is Afrofuturism, and it is the current, it's the critics' God job to interpret it. So, therefore, I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> the second thing is something I recognize in the process of the creation of the story Amnesty. When I was writing my novel, Babel 17, um, and I will remind you that it's based on a, a piece of, of, of inhuman governmental treatment of a, of a, of a, of a, born, of a, of a born Chinese scientist. He was literally shackled for two years you know, and held prisoner. That's, you know, that's pretty in, inhuman. Uh, when I was writing my novel, Babel 17, I wanted to write about a generic human being and put her at the center of the tale. This is a novel that was published in 1966, I think. Uh, as far as I knew, the mo uh, there, were slightly more, there are slightly more women, women than men in the world. Not a lot, but there are one or two. So therefore, a generic human being would have to be female. Uh, 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 as far as I knew, uh, uh, at, uh, at least, uh, at least though, as the statistical, statistical, st and statistically, humanity was something between 51 and 50, 52 percent female. At least those were the statistics I had at the time. So if I wanted a representative human being, it would have to be a woman. And that's whom I chose to be my, the hero of my novel. And that's how this Afro-American writer was thinking of that particular time. And this is how the book got written. Uh, and as I said, I chose a, 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 a Chinese woman because that was the largest group at the time, so that seemed to be a good choice for a, uh, gener you know, gen a generic human being. I also think it's important that Amnesty is very much a story in which an African-American author emphasizes with an Asian victim of the United States in order to create a believable analog of generic humans and very specific aliens, even as she chose to write about a black woman who is held captive by aliens and, cho and chooses to turn that history into something positive. In all of these stories, what seems to be most important is that there is something more powerful than any local notion of what creates racial distinctions. In More Than Human, it is the power that a group of people who, whose, combined power, uh, whose combined power that works together to make them as a group all but insurmountable together, and it is Butler's amnesty, and in Butler's amnesty, technology goes so beyond that, goes so beyond that the attempt to fire nuclear missiles produces the result that half those missiles are simply returned to sit on the floor. Uh, of the uh, of the sender, where the other half are, or where the aliens can make them show up, and in what condition represents the unknown of that power. In camp concentration, it is simply the fact that Mordecai Washington actually gets a chance to comfort the white kid from his own high school class from the other side of the Mensa table 
regardless of the pitfalls of our theopies. And in Tiger Tiger, the social and biological barriers to communication are overcome by the ability to learn new social codes that blur the racial ones, even as they are reduced to purely aesthetic enrichment during the course of the condensation of its epic plot. Thank you. Let me apologize for two things. One, let me apologize for not standing and delivering this upright. And two, um, any questions that anybody has, I would be happy to feel uh, as best I can. That, that's great. Uh, so, Professor Delaney, thank you so much. This is um, amazing. And uh, my job is basically to stall while you guys get your questions ready to go. So I'm just going to ask a couple of questions to start the ball rolling. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I was... Um, as I was sitting there, I was waiting for you to talk about Octavia Butler, and, and you did, which was so great. And then, and I was also waiting for you to talk about yourself, and, and you did a little bit, but, but can I press you on that a little more? Cause, okay, all, all right, you know, I'll, let, me, yeah. let me tell you, <laughs> let, me, let me be honest, talking about my own work is probably one of the most uncomfortable things there is, although given that I'm so uncomfortable, it's amazing how much I do it. <laughs> Well, okay, here's, I'll just, I'll just dangle this out there and you can, you can take it or not. But you said, you know, it's not my job. As a writer, it's, that's the critic's job. Yeah. But, but one of the things that's so amazing about your writing is that you incorporate criticism and theory into your writing itself. So of all writers, you're probably the best positioned to be your own critic. So. I cannot be my own. I don't think of myself as my own critic. I can, I can kind of describe work I've done. I can't critic. I can't really criticize. I can tell what I was trying to do. What I yeah. hope I did. Yeah. It's very hard for me to tell. I, it's impossible for me to tell what I did do. Um, that's simply because of where you sit. Uh, when you write a story, um, you basically have two things to go. You know, it's it's like trying to stand on the inside of a balloon and and make it look like something by pulling <laughs> it from the inside, and you have no idea whether you succeed or not. Uh, there's the, the, the best statement of this, I think, is by from Thomas Mann, who says, about the worth of my own work, I cannot know, and you cannot tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, well, okay, so maybe, try, yeah, mean, yeah. Having said that, try I'm fraud. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so I guess the question is, I, I totally hear what you're saying about the, um, the problematic origins of the term Afrofuturism, which make you feel like it has these limits and this, you know, sort of, um, you know, a particular white critic at a particular moment put these categories out there. But what, if, you know, what if you... And what I, if think, you I think that's what it, I think that's yeah. what it ought to stay. Yeah, I, mean, I the notion that it to be just what black writers write. Yeah. I think that's 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 called segregation. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, but do you want to take it up and put it in your own direction? Like, are you tempted to push the term in your own direction and no, say no, no, no? I almost never think about it. I write about black characters. I yeah. write about the characters I see around me. I write about people in my family. I write about people I've seen. I write about, I write about people I've seen in classrooms. You know, uh, I write about people I've seen, and you know, and that's that's what I work. Um, my current, um, the the book, the last science fiction novel that I wrote um, was not was in two thousand and seven, and it's a very long novel called Through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders. And it's the first thing you see on my website <laughs> when you start scrolling down on the homepage. Uh, and uh, you know, and I hope that's you know, and I hope you know, uh, I hope that's the one that gets bought. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But so you said something that I've, I I I've heard it said before, but I loved how you you put it that the science fiction. Um, is telling the story of how we put ourselves in the center and then we get evicted. Um, that it's the Not story. Not science fiction. No, this is history. Oh, history in general. History oh, does okay. this. All right. <laughs> I'll stand. I, okay. I do not know what. Yeah. I think this. I think the the. I think this goes back to somebody like Alfred North Whitehead. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or or maybe even Bertrand Russell, who keeps saying that. You know, we. Um, um, you know, um, it's got to be post Freud. 
because Freud was one of the great, has been, has, was cited with one of the great huge blows uh, delivered to the notion of, of human centrality by, by human, of, the, of the centrality of human consciousness because of the, the discovery of the unconscious. Mm. Yeah. You know, so uh, when, and, and, and you know and 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 Copernican you know and the Copernican yeah. revolution and all the others. So the Butler story you were describing, and a lot of Butler's work is like this too. I think it has a particular angle on that decentering, which is um, imagine us as for once the subordinate uh, mm -hmm. species. Yeah. You know, we're not top dog on the earth. All of a sudden, we have to grapple with the fact that we're the pet. Or the addictive drug, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do um, do you think? Um, I mean, for you, is that just kind of that's what science fiction shows us in different forms all over? Or do you think there's something specific to um, how Butler thinks about race in America? That's what gets her to that. Yeah. Well, I think I think it is. I mean, I think I think I think she, this. It's a very unsettling story because it's so close to, you know, a return to something like slavery. The only thing that separates it from slavery is the fact that they, the communities will make contracts and they will keep their, the communities are the ones who keep the contracts. Uh, we are the ones who fuck them up. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, when you read the whole story, there's much more chance of, uh, you know, the communities don't break their contracts, but they do, they want a certain amount of, can we, you know, we enfold you uh, and we want you uh, and uh, um, you know, and and we pay you. you yeah, know, you get paid for this. Yeah, you know, but, you, and, and you know, and in what money? You know, that's your thing. You know, you're the guys with the capitalist system. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, we can. You know, we have no problem getting the money. Um, well, so I think this would be a great moment to just ask uh, for other folks. And you, if you just put your hand up, I will try to get to you. You know, even if you're not called first, but. Yes, in the back there. Yeah. Yes, hi. So I really, really enjoyed it. I was oh, thinking a lot, too, about, especially when you're talking mm -hmm. about Katie about the blood child, which she keeps trying to say is not about slavery. But again, it's another complicated... Yeah, and, yeah. Blood, blood, blood child, child, the blood child, child itself. The humans is a, are the aliens. Right, yeah. And they come, and they have to be in this really complicated dynamic that... This is actually one of the best, mostly beautifully worked out. Yeah, Blood Child is a wonderful story to teach because, among other things, uh, she used to call it her male, her male pregnancy story, <laughs> which is it is among other things. I mean, she. And it's just one of the most chilling stories I think mm -hmm. I ever read. It's like, oh, that's so crazy. <laughs> uh, the other question I'm asking about Afrofuturism, just to come back to the topic, is. Um, it's interesting, I wonder how you feel about that, that term being sliced and diced and messed with as it moves to African science fiction, uh, where they want to, they're, they're trying to, sometimes I see with the critics are trying to sort out whether they're, they say, no, that's, we're, oh, they start doing, you know, like, oh, it's African, it's African American science fiction, it's Afrofuturism, and we're doing something else. And then right. some say, no, it's all the same. And, uh, so I, I have several questions. I'm interested in how this, the, the life of that term is living now. And second of all, uh, I'm interested in how, I'm sure you talked to some of the really wonderful writers that are in those Afro-SF volumes. In the, you know, the, the Afro-SF uh, collections and anthologies of African science fiction writers. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder, because they are looking to you and other uh, African-American uh, science fiction writers here. So. Well, you know, one of the things that's very funny, the, 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 um, the only people who ever, uh, in my situation, who've ever come up and said, I don't think you're black enough, you know, are white writers. <laughs> I think it was, you know, you know, I'm as black as I am. You know, I, I, you know, and I was born, born black. I was, you know, I was brought up black. You know, I did go to, a, I did go to elementary school where there were a lot of white people. You know, where there were a lot of white, well, a lot of white friends. I had black friends and white friends. I still do. Uh, and uh, um, you just, you know, you do what you, you know, you, 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 you play the hand you're dealt. You know, uh, and you write about what's out there to, to, to write about. Um, um, and you hope, and you hope for the best. 
Uh, I don't know what to, I don't know, um, I'm not sure, um, have I been to a black collective of writers within the past year to talk about them? No, <laughs> I haven't been to any collective of writers. I've been to a couple of science fiction collectors of writers in which there were a very few black writers. What does that mean? That means just what you think it means, you know, that there are probably not enough black writers, you know. Uh, it would be nice if there were more. Okay. I've always been fascinated by the Nebula Award story. I wonder if you'd share that. I don't know if this has been brought up in the classroom and the like. And if you don't feel like talking about it, that's no, no, I don't know. I've, 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 I've written about it. I've, I've discovered it. it's in, it's in a book called. It's in a, a, an essay called "Races." I assume you mean the story in racism in science fiction. Yes. Uh, uh, which is you can find that it's in it's in a, my most most recent non science fiction novel, which is called "The Atheist in the Attic," which is a no, a non science fiction novella. Uh, and it has a, a, an, a, 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 an, in, an interview published, and then also uh, the text of racism in science fiction. Um, the, the editors wanted to publish it, so they did. Um, what would you like to know about that story? Or, or you want me to retell the story? Uh, you could go off and they could all go off and read it. I mean, <laughs> you can you can you can go and get uh, one of the thing I do. I one of the things I don't like to do, and uh, this is what that goes about with you know, If I've written something down, you know, go read it. <laughs> you know, go you you can go to my website. It's Samuel. It's www.samueldelaney.com, and you will see a. Um, in, then you, there's your thing called books. There is a book called The Atheist in the Attic, and it contains the essay Racism in Science Fiction. Uh, it will be in some other. It will be in a collection, another collection of essays that's, so that I hope will be coming out called Occasional Views. But that's a year in the future. Then may I say I encourage everyone to read that and share with you the fact that I. By chance, I saw the title, Racism in Science Fiction, not terribly long ago, and I had no idea about that moment, mm -hmm. and especially after the negative introduction, when Isaac Asimov came by mm -hmm. and spoke to you. Yeah. Um, it's got, it, it, I, I, I do not, I think people have, over, sometimes people tend to overread it. Which is to say, basically, okay, basically what happened, I was being, I was being, I would, had just won a Nebula Award and had forgotten I was up for two, uh, that, that, and so I and found myself having won two Nebula Awards that night, and I was, um, and I, and, and it was a very fraught and moment. That's about the most prestigious award you can win in science fiction. We are, so to, given yeah. by the right, given by yeah. your fellow writers. Um, and um, as I said, I would prefer if you went and read it because it's uh, my the, the, <laughs> my my written version is much more facile than this verbal you know mishmash uh, of the the, the, uh, the of of the story. But um, as I was going up uh, to uh, uh, um, there was a lot of how do you put this? There was a lot of strange feeling in the room that evening uh, because. Um, um, well, again, this is, it's too complicated to explain in, in, in two minutes. Basically, as I got, the, as I, as I um, was, uh, I, uh, um, I, was, I accepted the second, and I was coming back, and there was a table in which Isaac Asimov and the agent Virginia Kidd were both sitting there, and, Virg I, and, um, uh, and there had been some, a great deal of hostility Expressed in one of the, the 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 talks, and some of it had been directed towards me, because my stuff was because clearly, my my stuff. Someone had said, "Well, your stuff is too literary," you know. You you're you're, it's you don't you're not following the good old rules of science fiction storytelling. <laughs> uh, and the the, the 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 it was an after dinner speech. I mean, it was one of those after dinner speeches that begins. 
many of you are not going to like what I say this evening. <laughs> you know, and and indeed nobody did. You know, at the end of that <laughs> speech, Fre the, the speech was given by Frederick Bull, uh, and it uh, and and not very many people applauded. You know, and then I you know and then and uh, um, uh, and it had been talked about the new kind of science fiction. Which was very literary, and and I had just won, you know, I had just won for a uh, a um, a novel where every chapter was was begun with a with a quote from some other um, literary literary Jacques work. Jacques Lacan, and, yeah, uh, yeah, it was well, called yeah. the Einstein Intersection, yeah, and so. Um, and then I won another one, as I said, for a short story. And so all I could say, you know, I go, you know, so I had to go up and get one twice, and I had said. That I've been awarded twice in one evening is very warming. I write my stories as best I can. Thank you very much for giving me this award. That's all I, I could think. I hadn't said anything for the first one other than thank you. Uh, and so I'm going back, and Virginia Kidd, bless her soul, who was a friend of, I thought of as a friend, she is now dead, and she put her hand on my arm, and she said, Chip, that was elegant. And I thought, Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> that was a nice thing to say. And Ike, you know, sort of, I was holding the Nebula Award in my hand. And he said, he looked over, and he was just doing a kind of male trip where you say the opposite of what the most, the most, the most, the, most, the, the, the worst thing you can, he said, you know, Trip, this is all just because you're Negro. Uh, now, this is a joke. This is a joke. What he was trying to say is, you're a really good writer, and this is not because you're Negro. You know, that's what it meant. I knew that. But it also meant uh, and I, that no matter, it also was a way of sort of saying, hey, no matter what happens, when no one is ever going to forget that you're a Negro. You know, just because you win an award like this, nobody's going to forget that you're black. You know. Um, it's always going to be memory, and, he's, and, and as far as that's concerned, he's probably right. You know, uh, he like, was probably right. You know. <laughs> well, once he said it, he was. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> I mean, exactly. <laughs> and I certainly hadn't forgotten it. You yeah. know? But the point is, but it was it was it was important to be. Um, okay, here's something that is not in that essay. I give you something new. <laughs> it is not in that essay. Whenever I have gone to a place where there's a possibility, I haven't done it today. Well, I'm not getting an award today, but whenever there's a possibility of me getting an award, I used to do, when I was a kid, I would always put a penny in my shoe so that I would, be, have, I would do something to rem, to, that would make me un, physically uncomfortable to remind myself that I was only human. And it was wow. just important to me. Huh. To be a little uncomfortable, so you know. And this is, you know, well, thing that there are things that make you uncomfortable. Um, I was also had a penny in my shoe that evening, <laughs> you know. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I do that. That was something that I do because, you know, to just to bear in mind, you are a person, you know, who could have something uncomfortable in their mm. shoe. Mm. You know, that's all. And so, so that, that's important. That's not in the essay, <laughs> <laughs> but it's for the, it's kind of it's kind of the same, the same thing. I, I'm reminded of a fact about my book collection. Um, I have a copy, I think, the first edition of The Jewels of Aptor. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that I bought it at the Main Street cigar shop in Evanston, which was the only place in my neighborhood where you could buy science fiction. Uh, and only science fiction you could buy there, and then I brought it back and kept it since that time. But it's very moving to me to think about what it felt like then to buy science fiction. Mm -hmm. Namely, you don't go to the library, you don't go to uh, Clock and Brentano's, yeah, you, you know, go, you, you go, go to the store to the with the the rack. Yeah. 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 And then from that moment to this moment in the Newhouse Center for the Humanities, it feels <laughs> like you and the genre have traveled a considerable distance. It's very moving for me to think about that. Oh, yeah, well, it, I think it has. I think in one in one in ways it has. Yeah. Mm. There. Any other? Are there any other questions? With you know, uh, yes, there's one. There's oh, good. I can't see. Sorry. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you went about world building. Um, you got to be real loud. Sorry. I was wondering in regards to world building, 
um, how you decide how to think about race, like how to approach it for each individual story, like whether it's something that's negligible or it's like discrimination is expressed in a different form or ideas of races are like how do you choose like how does this manifest itself or that's well, you know, again, um, is race negligible? It depends on what the story is about. Um, I learned about race, you know, I learned about, you know, I remember my first racial trauma was when I was five. <laughs> you know, when, 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 when my father, when, oh Lord, let me see if I can reconstruct this. I was going to a school that was mostly white. And one of the things that happened is that um, the um, we would walk in on the we would there were three black students in every class. You know that's you know and we, why were we there? Because if you could prove in that the, if the if if a white private school could prove that they weren't segregated that they weren't segregated, they got a tax break. <laughs> You know, they actually got a tax break, and so there were three. So there was a there. I was one of the three tax breaks in my class. You know, and so I'd been given this. I was a scholarship student. We couldn't have afforded Dalton on my own. But when we went in, Mrs. Durham, who was the headmistress of the school, to sh to 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 show how unprejudiced she was, as we would walk down the street, she would stop and shake the hand of all the black students. <laughs> and I mean, she would take my hand and she'd take, and then, well, the other black student was my cousin Mickey, <laughs> you know, and they, they, were, they were, most of us were related. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and she would refer um, another to Peggy Dammon's hand, who was also, who uh, was a kissing cousin whom we, we call, who, whose mother we called Aunt, Aunt Kay. Well, she was not an aunt, but she was, you know. Uh, but anyway, but th so we were socially from a very small, a very small group of people, you know. And so, and I, and blithe me, I'm five or six years old, and I come home and I say, Daddy, why does Mrs. Durham shake my hand and Mickey's hand and Peggy Dammon's hand, you know, and she doesn't shake anybody else's hand. My father had a fit. He yelled and he, he carried on, and, and the next thing I know, he was telling me how in the South, where he came from, how um, white people were just untrustworthy, and how a cousin of his had been lynched. In, you know, and she, she was like, like my father, like me. We were fairly light, and she was a fairly light woman. And she had been, uh, she was pregnant and with her much darker husband, and she had, they had been stopped, and she had been hung up, and she had been slid open, and her belly and her child had been dropped out, dropped dead on the ground. And then they brought their body, and both of them had been killed. And I'm five years old. You know, I'm listening to this. This is pretty traumatic. And my mother is sitting there and crying and say, Sam, to my father, Sam, you don't have to tell him this now. You don't have to tell him this now. And I'm saying, Daddy, Daddy, it wasn't fair. I, I still get upset. Why am I black? Because of that kind of experience that just went on. That was part of it. I don't mind sharing it with people. I don't, you know, uh, but it was, it was traumatic. You know, uh, I do not think it was, it came from my, fa it came from my father, you know, who was nuts. <laughs> I love him. I, you know, I, no, I didn't love him. I, I, I had a very rough relationship with my dad. But I think, but, but the point is, you know, I, and I think my mother probably was right. It probably was too young to tell. But I got it, you know, I, I just got it. <clears throat> so it, does it affect me? Yeah, it affects me. Uh, and sometimes I am writing about things like that, and sometimes I am not. And it's as simple as that. You know, it's there to be written about. And I am sure all of you have things that, you know, mm. that are part of your upbringing that are important like that. You know, some of it which are easier to deal with and some of them which are harder. And so that's the way it, work, it works. 
I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm not ashamed of it. We had a book by, edited by Paul Robeson called We Charge Genocide, which was filled with pictures of lynchings, of black lynchings. And I used to look through it, you know, and, and see all of these pictures, you know, these, these pictures. And I knew that they were pictures, you know, I knew they were pictures of things that happened to people in my race, you know, not somebody else's, you know. Um, and it may, you know, uh, history is what does that. So, I did not want to bring this to a, uh, <laughs> such a such a serious halt, but it's there. But the point is, the, these are the things that make it, you know, make it make 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 you who you are. So, so Chip, sometimes people say that science fiction, sometimes the account that's offered of it is it's escapism. It's let it's what lets you get you know on the spaceship and zoom away from that history. Like it's not our world; it's that other world. Mm -hmm. Is that is that how you think about it? Or? I'm, I don't I don't know. I, this it's, having made you sit through this, I'm going to ask you all to go through, go to my website, go to my go to my huh. Yeah. Okay, yes, well then, go to my website. <laughs> go to my website, and the first book, as I said, is a big book called Through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders, and there are two buttons that have um, essays about the book. Great. And one of them is by an African, not African-American, an African critic, black African critic, uh, named Kaguro Makaria, uh, and it's... It, it says about the book, and it says Macaria, and read his essay about the book, because he, one of the things that occasionally happens is you read an essay about a book, and you say, gosh, this critic seems to rec have read, read the book I remember writing. <laughs> what does that mean? And the, one of the reasons I like Macaria's essay is because it seems to be about the book I remember writing. And so I would like, and that'll give you some idea of what I so, thought I was doing. I'm really glad you offered us a way to dispel that image of you inside the balloon and us outside the yeah, balloon. Uh, so now we can imagine popping the balloon. Yeah, well, so, it's not, thank it's not you. about, no, yeah. you're still inside it, but for, for some time, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, it's, sometimes you do succeed in making it to the shape you want. Great. You know, that's yeah. Well, th Professor Delaney, thank you okay. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for your questions and, and for listening. <laughs>